morning. Good morning. Whoa. Hot mic. How are you guys doing this morning? Gosh, I hope so. So if everybody else can come file in and have a seat. I'm sure the last one to be seated will be my son. Oh, there he goes. So it's Graham. It's going to be Graham, I think. Nope, it's going to be Andrew. See how I call people out? Isn't this wild? Oh, David! Hard to miss you. <laughs> well, I was asked to give a um, God is in control little blurb here. Um, and I, ultimately, it turned into like a real life minute anyway. So anyway, so here's my, here's my uh, God is in control thing. So years ago, uh, Terry and I went whitewater rafting with um, my brother and sister-in-law. Anybody, some of you may know them, Haley and Stephen. Um, we were young. We didn't have kids yet. And um, I'm not sure why we did it. But anyway, so we go on this whitewater rafting trip. So up front, they tell you what are the dangers of whitewater rafting. What, what can happen, right? So they tell you about there's holes in the, in the rapids, right? These are um, places where the water has gone over like a rock face or something like that. And then what happens is water circles like this. It becomes a hole that can drag you down underneath. Well, sign me up. Yeah, let's go, right? So then they have these things called strainers, which is like a down tree. It's like sitting on the top of the water, right? And the water can kind of strain through it, and you can get stuck on that tree, right? Same type of thing. Sign me up, right? And then they talk about sieves. Sieves are actually... Um, rocks that are tightly packed together where the water can get through just fine, but you can't. So you get stuck, right? And then the best ones are undercuts. Those are like sieves, but they're like underwater. So you get stuck down there and you ain't coming back. Why did I get on this raft again? I'm not sure why. So you get caught in any one of these and drowning is, is likely. So... But they also teach you about it, your tripod. You got a tripod of stability. And basically what it is, you have two feet in the boat, right? You're supposed to lock one foot under, they got benches, right? But the benches aren't for sitting on. You actually sit on the side of the raft. But you, the benches are there for you to lock your feet into. So you lock one foot under, lock the other foot under. And the other third part of your tripod is your oar in the water, which seems weird, but that's what it is, right? So. But between those three things, you have your, your stability comes from those three, three things, the tripod. So if you're not rowing, you're not going to be stable. If you don't have your feet locked in, you're not going to be stable. I, um, I found out that, um, there, well, there's really only one thing that's for sure. The raft is going to float. All right? Even if, even if the air comes out of it, it's going to float. Right? So that's the only thing that's really for sure. So I found out personally what happens when you don't use your tripod properly. I went over twice. Yeah, I know. I didn't want to learn my lesson the first time. So, so the first time I went over, I didn't have my feet locked in properly. And I, I was rowing, but I didn't have my feet locked in. I went over. And I mean over. Like, I didn't, like, fall off the side. I went over. Uh, fortunately, there was somebody right there, grabbed my life vest, pulled me in. No big deal, right? For a moment, it was a big deal. Um, but I, I learned my lesson after that one. So the second time I went over, I went over kind of. Because this time, I locked my feet in. And my feet were locked. Like, there was no way I was going through that again. And I went over anyway. But what happened is I just kind of flipped over the side. My feet never unlocked from that raft. And again, somebody grabbed my life vest, pulled me back in. So I was thinking about this this morning. And it's like life often feels like whitewater rafting. Um. We spend a lot of time in the rapids. Like in the, when you go whitewater rafting, like honestly, 
we were on the New River, and there was like maybe, I don't know, maybe 10% of the time we were actually in rapids, right? Life isn't like that. I would say probably I'm in the rapids at least 75, 80% of the time. <laughs> it's like constant, right? Um, so uh, many times the, the stability that we may feel is an illusion um, because the danger is everywhere. Right? We've got holes that are caused by catastrophes in your life. There's a death in the family or uh, a friend moves away. Um, things that can be large or small, but they're catastrophes. It feels like you're flying over this cliff and you're getting sucked into the water and you're just drowning. There's uh, strainers. There's strainers in life. There's these tasks that hang on to you and don't let go. Right? It seems like uh, with cars these days. Right? I fix one thing and another thing breaks. You fix that, and that breaks. And Caleb's got his thumb up back there. It's like constant, right? Um, then there's the social media sieves and undercuts. They pull you down, and they don't let go at all. Um, that many times, if, like I said, I feel like I'm in the rapids. Sometimes I'm holding, only holding on by my feet. Lots of times I'm only holding on by my feet. There's many times where... Uh, um, I'm really gone over. Somebody's got to reach in and grab me, pull me back in. Um, and then, uh, but one thing is for sure, God is the raft. He doesn't sink. He can't sink. It's like impossible for him to sink, right? He's always there. The church, the church are the rescuers. They're the people that grab you by the life vest and pull you back in, right? And, um... If you, want to, if you want to kind of put this around, God is in control. God has put all these things in place. His, his, he is the raft. He, his word is your tripod. And his church is your rescuers. He's put all these things in place way ahead of time before we even were born to help us in the rapids. Thank you. Will you stand with us, please? Your grace 
All right, good morning. Thanks for coming out this morning. Um, I want to let you know about something that we're going to do next Sunday, okay? I'm calling next Sunday Conversion Sunday, and uh, here's why. I don't know if you know, today's my birthday. I am 60 today. And this is where you say, you don't look 60. So I, I, we, we always celebrate our birthdays, right? We know when our birthdays are. We always celebrate the day we were born. But for those of us that are Christians, isn't it really even more important the day we were born again, the day we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we pass from death to life, from darkness to light? And um, it just seems like we should have a day each year where we celebrate that. Now, some of you, maybe you know the exact day when you trusted Christ. I don't. Um, how many of you know the exact day? Yeah, a couple of you. All right. For the rest of us, we don't know the exact date, and I don't know the exact date. So I thought, um, I'm just going to pick a date to celebrate my conversion. So I happen to pick the Sunday after my birthday. So that's next Sunday, um, October 10th. We're going to call this Conversion Sunday here. And uh, the person who's going to do a real life minute is just going to tell you about when he came to faith in Christ. And then we're going to kind of have open mic. And if you would like to take one minute, no longer than one minute, to just share when you put your faith in Christ, you'll have an opportunity to do that. And I think it'll just encourage us to hear all of our faith stories. So that's next Sunday. All right, Bill Mays, come on up here. Bill's got an um, announcement about an opportunity for service. Thank you, Dean. Good morning. Uh, yes, we are going to start uh, soon, perhaps by the end of October, a project to improve our, our downstairs lower level facility. And uh, the project's kind of comprehensive because the rest of the building's been pretty up upgraded, but the basement needs a lot of work, particularly the green room. So we have some things planned, give you an idea what's included in that. Um, we're going to put new heavy duty lockable heavy wood doors, new metal frames around all the classrooms. We've added security, better sound deadening, and just improve those rusty old door frames and give us some uh, better security there, consistent with the uh, security team's recommendations. Uh, we're going to install TV monitors in all the classrooms, help the teachers to use audiovisual aids in their classrooms. Uh, we're going to do painting in the main auditorium, uh, part down there in all the classrooms as well. Uh, we're going to go and do some lighting upgrades in the, in the main sanctuary, main part of it downstairs, as well as perhaps some of the rooms, depending on our needs. And uh, the little green room needs a lot of work. We're going to put new carpeting in there, new paint. And uh, the little bathroom down there, we're going to uh, put new ceramic tile in, new bath fixtures, new lighting, new paint, to just freshen the place up for the little ones where they meet. So there's a lot of work. Now, the good news is that uh, the money is all available. We have the money to do this. And, uh, and that's the good news. The bad news is there's a lot of work to be done. But the rest of the good news is we have a chance for you to have opportunity to serve. That's the good news. And so I want to make you aware of that. Uh, we're gonna, it's, it's, it adds up to a lot of work, frankly. And rather than contract it all, we're going to take that on ourselves and kind of work as the schedule permits. It seems that every day there's something going on in our church schedule. But we're going to have to work between the activities on days, weekends, evenings, whenever we can to make sure it happens. So we're going to need people to sign up and help us with some tasks, do a lot of painting. Got a little painting room. We'll have somebody to lead, head that group up. We need a lot of people that can paint. We need somebody that can do some installation, some wiring of TVs and lighting upgrades and install the monitors. We have to strip out some carpeting and put some ceramic tile down and that sort of thing. So flooring, uh, some bathroom fixtures, people who can help with cleanup. You may have specific trades or skills you can use. I know some of you do that. We can look forward to using those skills, but some of you just want to come and help out, lay at hands and service to help out the people that need to do that. Uh, so we're looking forward, and it's men and women, both guys, youngsters, young men, women, uh, you're welcome to join us in this project, and uh, we'll be uh, keeping you posted. So there's, I made some copies of this information sheet, it's about 20 sheets available out on the uh, desk out there, in the welcome desk. And if you'd pick one of those, if you're interested in able and available, pick one of those up. It'll tell you more about the project. And it also has contact information, my phone number, my email. So if you have an, a question, you want to sign up, let us know. Just be in touch so we know what you're going to do. Uh, you're available, and we could really use the help and would just encourage each of you to do. Okay, so keep that in mind, and we'll begin that project. We're really waiting on the long lead items, the doors, and th in these days, it's very difficult to get commitments on materials and installations, but we're waiting on that to happen, and as soon as that does, we'll kick the project out. I have one more small detail. Dean mentioned that it's his birthday. It's his 60th birthday. Dean, come on up for a second, would you? 
I wanted to, we're going to sing happy birthday, but I wanted to, Dean, have a very significant, significant remembrance, a gift from all of us to him. So, Dean, would you accept this on our behalf? Your generous church body wants to contribute this to you. You can show the folks your gift. It's a church mug. A genuine, a genuine, isn't that nice? Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dean. Happy birthday, dear you. You know that, do you know that Dean has beautiful feet? He does. It says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You do that on a weekly basis. Brother Dean, we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother. Thank you. Sneha Matai, come on up here. We're introducing to, uh, Sneha today as a new church member. Uh, church membership is just where uh, you say, I am a believer in Jesus, and I want to be united with this church. I'm committing to this local body of believers, and I'm asking uh, you all to keep a uh, spiritual watch over my life. So today we introduce uh, Sneha as a new church member. Uh, she's 24. She graduated from Wheaton College with a biology degree. Uh, she hopes to go to medical school in uh, the future. So let me shake your hand. Welcome to membership at Lake Point. And I want to give you this uh, Lake Point mug. <laughs> Next Sunday, Sneha's leaving uh, to do uh, some ministry in a really wonderful place uh, in New Hampshire called His Mansion. In fact, we got a picture. We're going to put it up on the board. And so I asked her if she would just tell us a little bit about what she's going to be doing at uh, His Mansion. Grab that mic there. Is that turned on? Yeah, so next week I am moving to his mansion in New Hampshire. Um, and if that place sounds familiar to a lot of you, it's because the men's group at Lake Point does a trip there, I think almost every year. Um, so honestly, if you have questions about the place, they could probably answer your questions better than I could at this point. Um, but yeah, his mansion is for people who are healing, healing from addiction and hoping to recover. Um, and the mission of his mansion is to, um, it's healing, th healing from struggles and hurts through genuine relationships with Christ and others. Um, and that's what really drew me to the place. And yeah, I will be working there as what they call a servant leader. So I'm part of the servant leader program. So I'll be there for around a year. Um, and basically what I'll be doing is just um, going to classes with residents, um, doing work with them, living with them, basically just um, being there and building relationships with people. So yeah, I appreciate everyone who's been praying for me so far and making this decision. This, this decision. Um, but yeah, I would appreciate prayers in this next year just for um, myself and the residents that will be there and the rest of the staff. When are you leaving? I'm leaving next Sunday. You're driving out there? I am driving. Let's just pray for Sneha. Father, we commit our sister to you, and uh, we ask that you'd give her safety on the drive out there next Sunday, uh, and that you would use her, her personality and her gifts, her knowledge of you, her love for you, to make a difference in the lives of the young people who are there with different addictions and struggles in their lives. Please use Sneha to minister to them and bring them to a place of, of health and uh, life and joy in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget your mug. <laughs> right now, we have a real life minute uh, by a man who um, has been telling me no for years. Uh, Jesse Alvarado, come on up here. He finally decided, you know, I need to be willing to, to share with the body, you know, what the Lord is teaching me. That's what a real life minute is. What's the Lord teaching you? What's he doing in your life? So Jesse, it's great to have you do your very first real life minute. No mugs for you. I don't have any more. It's on, it's on. 
Okay, well, all right. So, but I started thinking here, and I'm, <clears throat> I had a, <clears throat> there is a real significant thing that uh, happened in my life, and it happened over a period. And it's current because uh, to this very day, it's affects it's, uh, my life probably greater than any other event. And I'm gonna take you back 62 years. We're not gonna go every year, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I was a senior in high school, and uh, a classmate of mine, uh, uh, Arnie Swenson was his name, he and I, uh, we formed a pact. We were gonna go to college together. And uh, we uh, did interviews, uh, we visited three, three campuses, and finally came upon a decision that uh, we were gonna go to uh, a school in Decatur, Illinois. It was called Millican University. So I was kind of relieved. I said, well, I got that behind me and I can move on to other things, I got that decision. But then shortly after we decided that, Arnie called me. And he said, Jesse, he says, I'm not going to Milligan. And I asked him, why not? He says, well, I'm having some problems with them uh, uh, straightening out some terms of my scholarship. So I said, well, Arnie, what do you want, what do you want to do? He says, I want to go to Iowa Wesleyan. So I said, well, I said, all right, I'll, I'll stay with the pack. I'm going with you to Iowa Wesleyan. So to make a long story short, then after that, uh, my life was switched, and I'm now uh, a freshman at Iowa Wesleyan College. And when I got there, uh, of course, you, you tend to congregate around other freshmen and make friends. Uh, there was a young lady down there at that school. Her name is Linda Schneider. And um, she and I got to be friends along with many others. We were just friends. I, there, although there was one thing, she had an illegal cat in her dorm. And any time they had room inspection, that, uh, she'd hide that cat in my car. But, uh, but it was finally the second semester. We had our first date, and we started dating. We dated all through the... Uh, rest of the uh, second semester. And then, um, of course, uh, summer came and it was time for us to split up. She went back home to the farm in Iowa and I went to Chicago, so didn't see each other for three months. And then the next year, uh, the, our sophomore year, very routine. Uh, we both were at Iowa Wesleyan and we dated all through the, um, the year at Iowa Wesleyan. So no significance there. But uh, at the end of the of our uh, sophomore year, it's time to split up for the summer again. Uh, Linda decided to go to the University of Texas summer school, and uh, so she took off there. And I was then went back to Chicago to earn money to go back to class. Well, of course, when Linda came back uh, from Texas, uh, she she couldn't stop raving about how she loved Austin, Texas. And I found out much years later, I knew why. So then um, when uh, school started, uh, our, our junior year, that uh, Linda also decided she was gonna transfer. So she transferred to the University of Iowa. I in turn went back to Iowa Wesleyan. So now she's at the University of Iowa and I'm at Iowa Wesleyan. Now like I said, all summer she was in Texas and I was in Chicago. So you wonder how we could even recognize each other after a while. So um, the, uh, towards the end of the first semester of my junior year there, my mother called me. She told me, she said uh, that my father was, had been helping a relative carry some furniture down some stairs. He tripped and he had a severely broken leg and was gonna be out of commission for quite a while. So I thought, well, I better go home and help out wherever I could. So I transferred from Iowa Wesleyan to Roosevelt University in, in Chicago. So now I'm in Chicago and Linda's at the uh, University of Iowa. And um, so at the end of our, our third year, Linda being, having, she had summer school credits and being a lot smarter than I am, she managed to graduate after three years. So upon her graduation, she's already interviewing for jobs and uh, one of the places that, uh, well, the place that offered her a job was um, an out a marketing outfit located in Chicago. They were located in the Merchandise Mart. So she took that job, she packed up, and she moved to Chicago, where I already was uh, uh, working, uh, doing summer work. So that was good. So for a few months there, we were together. And uh, then the, when the summer was over, I decided that I was gonna go back to Iowa Wesleyan to finish my uh, degree there. So I'm off to Iowa Wesleyan. Linda uh, decided that uh, 
Marketing really wasn't for her. What she wanted to do was teach. So she took a job in Waterloo, Iowa, teaching high school English. So now she's in Waterloo, and I'm back in my Westland. So, so this went on. Uh, we had a lot of correspondence, very little physical contact. Uh, I'd see her for short spurts, and uh, that was it. And phone contacts, uh, of course, too. So at the uh, end of the uh, uh, my, uh, my year there down there, uh, yeah, I got to recall now, this is going back six, two years. That, uh, uh, I got to uh, getting ready to uh, graduate myself. And the, at that time, uh, the draft was chasing me right and left. I was getting all kinds of valentines from them. And I said, well, I'm just going to jump the gun here. So I'm going to enlist in the Air Force, which is what I did. When I enlisted in the Air Force, they gave me an appointment to officer training school. But the appointment opening was not until the following January. So I was going to be in Chicago uh, all that summer and then the fall and the early winter into the following January. Meanwhile, Linda is over at uh, Waterloo, Iowa teaching. So again, it's just phone conversations, uh, notes back and forth. I'm not a very good write letter writer, so uh, she got very few letters from me compared to what she sent me. So uh, I'm going down and uh, <clears throat> here I am uh, getting ready to go to officer training school. And it's January of 1964. Linda didn't drive down to Chicago to see me off. And uh, I think we had maybe a day and a half together or something like that. Then I flew off and, uh, to go to officer training school, which is in San Antonio, Texas. So now I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Linda's back in Waterloo, Iowa. So, I mean, if this sounds crazy, it is. You wonder about it. So and officer training school was three months long. And I was to graduate from there on March 31st. And uh, I started thinking, I said, well, when I, when I graduate from there, I'll be a commissioned officer. I'll get an assignment somewhere, so I'm going to have some stability in my life. I think it's about time that she and I got married. So I thought, well, I'm going to, upon commissioning, I'm going to uh, uh, offer her uh, uh, my hand in marriage, or, or ask for her hand in marriage, I guess would be more appropriate. Uh, but I, I had one concern. I didn't know where I was going to be sent is uh, I didn't have my orders yet. And I'm thinking, boy, it's no way to start, take a bride uh, to Tooling, Greenland, or Gooseberry, Labrador, or up in the Dewland, some, or say goodbye and head off to Vietnam. So just before graduation, uh, I got my orders, and I said, I was really concerned. I looked down at them, and I thought, oh, God, you were really looking out after me. Because uh, they said 14 days after graduation, I was to report to Bergstrom Air Force Base in Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I called Linda, told her I was going, asked her if she would marry me. She consented, unfortunately. And we had to, we had to really hustle to do a whirlwind marriage because I only had 14 days from uh, the time I graduated from Officer Training School. So upon graduating from Officer Training School, I flew to Chicago, took care of some business there, packed some of the things I was to take to Bergstrom. And then from there, I hustled over to Waterloo, Iowa, and I remember I got there, picked her up from class, uh, went, and uh, we had to grab a, a fellow teacher of hers for a witness. We went over to the courthouse, and <laughs> we got a marriage license. Then from there, we went uptown and got a couple of rings, and we we're really rolling. But, uh, <laughs> so on, uh, on April 11th, uh, we did have a real nice wedding. It was in a small Episcopal church in uh, Waterloo. Many of Linda's family and, uh, came down and friends from Iowa. My folks and uh, a lot of my family came up to Chicago. We had friends from uh, college, uh, both uh, University of Iowa and Iowa Westland, and we had a very nice ceremony. And then to keep things going like it had been going, two days after we got married, I had to leave. I had to report to my base in, in Austin, Texas. Linda had to stay there to finish her teaching contract. So we said goodbye, and uh, off I went. So finally, uh, at the end of June uh, that year, Linda finally com uh, completed her teaching contract. I had, uh, in the meantime, been temporarily sent to Amarillo, Texas, to attend the procurement officer school. Linda packed up and met me in Amarillo, and then we began our life together. 
And uh, like I said, I think back now, the Lord plays such a big role in there. He had to be the one to switch me get to go to Iowa Wesleyan. I figured that was his doing, and I thank him uh, every day for that. And then beyond that, uh, there's another value the thing that I got to uh, go in Iowa Wesleyan. I'd always attended public schools, attended a Catholic church. Uh, I never really studied the Bible much. We, weren't, we really weren't encouraged to do that. Uh, but when I got to Wesleyan, uh, I had to take a year of uh, Bible study, half a semester of uh, Old Testament and one of New Testament. So I finally had to uh, get in there and dig in a little bit and learn something about what the word of, of uh, Christ is. So then, uh, uh, like I said, we, I think about the, the separations we had, and I think the only way we could have sustained our relationship was with God's help. Because you think back on the separations we had, there's no way it should have uh, uh, continued, but it did. And again, uh, I think the, the Lord played a big part in that. And a little capping on this whole story is that uh, we, we're now been married. We celebrated 57 years of marriage uh, last April. And uh, we had about three uh, great children. And with them came uh, a wonderful daughter-in-law, uh, two wonderful sons-in-laws. And we have 10 grandchildren. They're just loving creatures of the world. And uh, now it's, it's continuing because now we have three great-grandchildren. One of them just born a month and a half ago. So the Lord's still working on my behalf. And uh, so I, I, and I thank him that uh, he made, made me in his image, made all of us in his image. And in doing so, he granted us a benefit that uh, he has of uh, unlimited capacity for love that uh, we can give to all those we knew. And I think that uh, it's a tool we have that uh, we should definitely use it. Thank you, Jesse. Will you guys all stand with, with us? I'm going to teach a new song. This song is called All Glory Be Forever. I want, as we, as we sing this song, to be walking, looking at the words as it walks through the gospel. Um, we'll, we'll start off singing, we had turned from God to sin's disgrace. We had chosen the path to hell. Perfect law of God condemned our race for all in Adam fell. But the righteousness of God appeared, and the world found hope again. For the righteous one has come down to bear all the curse of sin and death. And then the chorus will sing, Now, to him who's seated on the throne, all glory be forever. So as we learn this song together, think of the words, think of what we're singing, think of the gospel and our position before God, but what God has done for us. Turn from God to sin's disgrace. We chose the path to hell. Perfect law of God condemned our race. For all in Adam fell. But the righteousness of God appeared and the world found hope again. For the righteous one has come down to See you. 
Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. We're going to sing at the cross. And in the lyrics of the song, I'm reminded of this is... This is where we found love, in the cross of Jesus Christ, in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And we need to continually be coming back to this. This is where we're laying down our lives at the feet of Jesus because we're in awe, awe of God and of what he's done, where his love ran, down, ran red and our sins washed white. We owe all to him.
to remember your cross. We thank you so much for what you have done for us there. May it change our lives and our thoughts and our actions. God, thank you for your sovereignty and your gift of love crucified, Lord. God, now if there's anything that you want to say to us, Lord, we are willing to listen. Amen. All right, thanks, praise team. And Jesse, thank you for your, your real life minute. Say I asked you to list all of your greatest accomplishments in this life so far. Maybe you would mention some sports achievement. Maybe you would mention some award that you won in music or art or science or academic. Maybe you would mention the, the highest degree that you've earned at, in, in, in academics. If you're married, maybe you would mention your long marriage and, and your great kids. Maybe you would mention some position you've attained at work or in some other organization. Let me ask you this question, though. When you start thinking about your accomplishments, do you ever slip into inappropriate pride? Because I know I do. I start thinking, well, I accomplished that thing because I'm smarter than other people. Or I accomplished that thing because I'm just more dedicated than most. I accomplished that thing because I forced myself to stay focused. Or I, I accomplished that thing because um, I'm just more disciplined than most people are. And pretty soon I get thinking, well, I accomplished those things on my own with no credit given to God, who really is the one who made them possible in the first place. Do you ever do that? We are in the midst of a 12-week study of the Old Testament book of Daniel. And there's a figure, there's a person in this story that just looms large on the world stage. Who am I thinking of? King Nebuchadnezzar. In 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and his army conquered Judah and Jerusalem, and he took many of the uh, Jewish people captive back to Babylon, and the people were just in despair. How will we ever stand up to this man? This is the most powerful man in the world. This is the most powerful empire in the world, and they know it. Nebuchadnezzar knows how awesome he is and the power that he wields. And the people were in despair. We're never going to be able to go home again. We're never going to be able to build our temple again. We're never going to be able to worship the way we want to. Our whole lives are out of our hands now. We will never have our lives restored again the way we were, they were meant to be. But the book of Daniel that we're studying was written to tell them and to tell you and me that despite appearances, God is in control. So let's look at that today in Daniel chapter 4. Turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 4. If you want to use the Bible that's in the pews, it's page 1268. Daniel chapter 4, or page 1268 in the pew Bible. Daniel 4, we're going to start at verse 4. And surprisingly, we read the words of Babylon's all-powerful, arrogant king. Daniel 4, starting at verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Now, pause there. This chapter is really long, so we're not going to read all of it. What I'd like to do is just tell you uh, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and then we'll read the part where Daniel interprets the dream for him. So it tells us that Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about a tree, and it was a, a massive tree. And it says it was the largest tree in the world. In fact, it said that you could see the tree anywhere throughout the earth. And it says the birds of the air nested in the tree. And the animals on the ground um, uh, took, took, uh, 
took the shade of the tree and the tree provided for them. It was an awesome tree. But then in his dream, all of a sudden an angel appears and the angel yells out, cut down that tree. And they do, they cut the tree down. But the angel says, leave the stump and put an iron band around it to show that it is still alive. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar was seeing in his dream. But then all of a sudden, the tree turns into a man. And the angel says in the middle of verse 15, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Verse 17, the decision is announced by the messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. And that is the end of the dream. And it terrified Nebuchadnezzar. I think Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly what this dream was about. Now he calls his man, he calls Daniel and says, please interpret this dream for me. But why would that terrify him unless he knew exactly what this was saying? Verse 18. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, that is Daniel, tell me what it means. For none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, I find that kind of humorous. If you're a Christian, did you ever get a compliment for, for something in your actions or personality, but people had no idea like uh, what it was about you that made you that way? They didn't know what to attribute your, uh, your actions to. So they're like, uh, oh, you're kinder than most people. It must be the, the spirit of namaste lives in you. And you're like, no, it's Jesus. <laughs> Daniel, you can interpret the dream because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Verse 19, then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Now, I kind of think that's funny, too. The king is telling Daniel, don't let my dream alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. Now, Daniel is hesitant to explain the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. But I don't think it's out of fear because Daniel has stood up to Nebuchadnezzar plenty of times. He doesn't live in fear, but he's hesitant to explain it to him. And the reason, I think, is because he cares about the king, which is surprising because this is the king who tore down Jerusalem. This is the king who tore apart the temple of Yahweh. And it seems to us that he had every reason to take great pleasure in pronouncing Nebuchadnezzar's doom. But Daniel doesn't take any pleasure in pronouncing that. He, he's a man of God. He cares for this pagan ruler. Now, I think there's a lesson there for you and I as Christians because sometimes there'll be a political leader who we just really disagree with but we don't wish them ill we still pray for them now I'm guessing um, if you really like our current president you probably didn't like the former president and if you really like the former president you probably don't care for the current president but we don't wish them ill we'll still pray for them we ask that God would give them wisdom in the same way that the man of God, Daniel, does not wish ill on Nebuchadnezzar, he cares for him, even as he pronounced God's truth to him. Verse 20, 
The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. Verse 24. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign. Something's going to happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to become insane. You're going to be driven out of the palace until you acknowledge that you're not in control. All those achievements in your life are really not just how disciplined and how much smarter you are than other people. This is going to happen to you until you acknowledge that God alone is in control over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes the command to leave the stump of the tree with its uh, roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Now, I can think of two times in the Bible where God did pronounce judgment on someone but then he delayed it. I think of King Hezekiah of Judah. Uh, the prophet Isaiah went to Hezekiah and said, put your house in order because you're going to die. But it tells us that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed. And then it tells us that God gave him 15 more years of life. So he still died, but God delayed the judgment. A second time when I can think of God delaying judgment is, remember Jonah went to this large city of Nineveh, and he pronounced, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. But then the people believed and repented, and it says, turned from their evil ways, and God gave them many more years. It wasn't overthrown in 40 days. Eventually, it was overthrown, but there was a, a delay in God's judgment. So I actually think that here Nebuchadnezzar did accept Daniel's advice for a while, about a year. It seems that he began to uh, practice humility and thankfulness. But like sometimes happens to us when we, start, when we end a bad habit or start a new good habit, uh, it slipped away from him and he returned to his old habits. Um, we're going to see that here in a minute. I do find it interesting in verse 27, when God tells what he wants from Nebuchadnezzar, he says, um, be kind to the oppressed. Nebuchadnezzar, in your pride and in your arrogance, you must repent from that. And this is what I want from you, to be kind to the oppressed. Now, verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Hey, pause right there. Is Nebuchadnezzar exaggerating about Babylon is this wrong because it just really wasn't true and Babylon wasn't all that great? No, this was the most magnificent city in the world at the time. Do you know that two of the seven ancient wonders, wonders of the ancient world were in Babylon at this time? The Hanging Gardens and the Walls of Babylon. It was a magnificent city. And so it, it reminds me of like when a person says, well, it's not gossip if it's true. Well, yeah, it's still gossip, even if it's true, you know? Someone will say, it's not bragging if you can bring it. You know, it's not bragging if it's true. Well, yeah, it's still bragging. What um, Nebuchadnezzar says here about Babylon is true, but he's become arrogant and boisterous. 
So it's not that it wasn't true. What was the problem? It was his pridefulness, his lack of giving credit to God. So verse 31 now, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. That phrase, uh, for seven times, is usually interpreted to be for seven years, but we don't know that for sure. Well, I found myself wondering if uh, this incident is mentioned anywhere else other than the Bible. Are there any extra biblical sources for this event in Nebuchadnezzar's life? Because King Nebuchadnezzar is a historical figure. There's a lot of um, uh, resources about just his existence, but there's no exhaustive record of everything that Nebuchadnezzar did and had happened to him. And even if there was, I think it'd be understandable that he didn't want this part recorded. But there are two things that I wanted to mention from history. Uh, the first one is there's a document called the Prayer of Nabonidus. You can see it on the screen. This is a, a document from the time. And the prayer, Nabonidus was actually the last king of Babylon. He was the, uh, the father of Belshazzar. And uh, this document tells how Nabonidus fell ill for seven years, and then an unnamed Jewish man prayed for him and healed him. And so the thinking is that maybe that actually happened to Nebuchadnezzar, but in the document it's attributed to Nabonidus. A second possibility is that there's a, a document that records a speech by King Nebuchadnezzar. And um, he knows that his kingdom's in trouble, that Persia is growing in the east. And he speaks about the coming unnamed king of Persia who will overthrow Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar wishes that that person will become like a beast in the field. That is, what happened to me will also happen to, to him. So those are two possibilities where it may have been mentioned outside of the Bible. Let's pick it up in verse 34, where it goes back to Nebuchadnezzar speaking. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. Now, there's a lot involved in that phrase. That's the point at which he meets God's requirements. And my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Verse 36 now. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. What a revealing phrase from an arrogant king. Say that part out loud with me. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Just the men. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Let me finish with this. While there's a lesson here for you and me about uh, not being prideful or arrogant, remember that uh, the purpose of the book of Daniel was to assure God's people, God's hurting people, that despite appearances, God is in control. Despite appearances, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Uh, so the main message to the Jewish people originally and to you and me is that those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. The people felt helpless before a seemingly all-powerful, arrogant king. But what God is saying is, no, you are not helpless. Actually, maybe you are helpless, but I am not helpless. Despite appearances, God is in control. 
So when you think in your life about what it is that just seems is so far out of your control and you're not sure if you're ever going to have your life and your sanity back again, God is inviting us to remember that despite appearances, despite your lack of power, he is all-powerful and he is in control. There is no person, there is no thing in my life that God does not have control over. There is no person, there is no thing in your life that God doesn't have control over. And we also know that Jesus Christ has overcome an enemy more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar and a kingdom more oppressive and ruthless than Babylon. So I would like us to close our service by praying together the prayer that Nebuchadnezzar prayed in verse 34. We're going to put it up on the screen. Would you stand? We're going to pray this out loud together, and then our service will be dismissed. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Thank you for being here this morning. We're going to have a little break now. And at 11.15, we'll have a Sunday school classes. The adult Sunday school class will be right in this uh, uh, auditorium. We're dismissed. <laughs>